Hi, Jeff. <laughs> Hi, Jeff. Anyway, I go. Jeff. I know that name. I know that voice. Oh, arigato. I would like to remind everyone in the audience to please mute, mute your microphones and turn your video off. All right, I will. Video. I wonder if no. I Hi. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending today's episode of SCEP Live Online, a production of University of Hawaii Presents, based at the University of Hawaii at Manoa Outreach College. My name is Tim Slaughter, your host for today. I'd like to thank our sponsors, the Hawaii State Foundation on Culture and the Arts, the National Endowment for the Arts, the University of Hawaii, and Ka'unoa Senior Center. If during today's performance you have questions or comments, you may send them via Zoom's chat function and we will go over them at the end. And um, as was mentioned earlier, please keep off your, uh, turn off your, um, Monitor your video and your audio so as that everyone may enjoy today's performance. We're excited to continue Skep Live Online with an exceptional artist. Jeff Gear is celebrated for his physical style of storytelling, his chorus of different voices, and rubbery face. As drama specialist for Oahu's Department of Parks and Recreation for 28 years, he produced the Talk Story Festival, Hawaii's largest free storytelling celebration, Talk Story Radio, two years of weekly Pacific Island tales on Hawaii Public Radio, and Story TV. He performs regularly across Hawaii and performs internationally in countries including Guam, Samoa, Spain, Arctic Canada, Taiwan, Thailand, India, China, and Romania. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome to Skep Live Online, Jeff Gear. Hi. Wow. I have been waiting so long for this moment. I had an hour and a half uh, of stories prepared for you. I had four different settings in my house, and we finally whittled it down to a tight little half hour on my lanai at my house. So aloha. Thank you. I am pleased to be with you in your home from my home. Thanks to Skep for inviting me to do this. Thanks to you for coming. There are 30 of us about in this audience, and they are coming from all over the world. At least before I checked it out, there was from Romania, China, uh, a couple of people from Java said they'd come in. Bay Area is in the house, yo. Uh, who else? Ireland, hi. Neil, hi. So I am just excited as can be. Zoom is a new phenomena in which we meet. Long did I argue that it could not replace the live show. However, I was doing collages. I do collages. I love doing collages, and I've got a lot more time to do them without being disturbed in my house these days with the coronavirus. So I got an email, oh, what's this? Oh, I'm gonna do, oh, there's a, there's a chat meeting, there's a story swap in Maine now. I tuned in, I knew some of the people in the little uh, mosaic that we use on Zoom to see who's in the audience. And an old woman was laying on her bed like this. She was talking into the camera. She was saying how humans need touch, how she ached to have arms embrace her, that the lack of affection was palpable. It hurt her. She said that the uh, convalescent home where she lived, there had been three deaths already. The staff was shocked. They didn't know what to do. They had the patient, the uh, elders in their rooms. They couldn't come out except for one hour of exercise once a day. Her daughter, who lived next door because she could come and visit grandma with the two kids, wanted to see her. 
They spent a lot of time talking to the little boys, two little boys, five and seven, about how grandma can't be touched or she'll get sick. But we're going to go see her. But when you see her, you can't touch her. They pulled up. Grandma came out for one hour of exercise. The car doors exploded open. The boys came running out. Grandma, grandma. Grandma went, no, 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 no. And then the boys changed their arc and began to run around grandma. Giddy, laughing, squealing with joy. The mother, the daughter of the woman telling the story said, what are you doing, boys? We're surrounding grandma in a circle of our love. The daughter of the mother who was being surrounded in that circle, the grandma telling a story to me, telling it to you, said that she, mama, mama, when the children, the boys said that running around you, I could see you literally bloom with the love of that embrace. And I thought to myself, I'm wrong. Zoom can bring us together closer, deeper. The affection between you and me on this format, magic does and can happen through Zoom between us. So there's the first story. You guys go, ho, in your house. You go, ho, wow, thanks. Put your hands up like this. Chuck, put it up. I can see you. Chuck, chink, chunk. Now put that story in your pocket to tell to another friend later. That's the first story. Now as an interlude, I want to share with you an image. This is a self-portrait of Jeff as a virus. Because I can. <laughs> um, I have a thing for mermaids. I in this quarantine time have been reading a lot of Selkie stories. Neil, you'll know a lot of those stories. Uh, s seals that turn into women that have affairs with men, some beautiful, some not. Uh, sometimes the skin is involved. How the woman skin is treated by the man defines what has become a, to me a metaphor for divorce. Because what do you do with the children? And they're half seals and they're half human and Okay. And I have a story in my mind that's percolating. It's been there for years. I want to do it at the aquarium here in Honolulu. You're all invited when I get it together, but it hasn't come together yet. Anyway, I used to work for the city and county of Honolulu's Department of Parks and Recreation as the drama specialist. Yes, I did. And part of that was to be an official at the Valentine's Day dance down in our big Neil Blaisdell Convention Center. I thought it was corny. It was like a prom for seniors. And they, but they got really duded up and they'd have red and white sashes and they'd give them, of course, you know, a red rose and they'd, they'd escort them out and everybody sat in big giant chair circles for the dancing after her, Macarena. It's there that I last saw her. Hannah Kaniakoa Basso. She was old when I joined the department, and 30 years later when I retired, she was still old. She always looked the same. That gorgeous, dark brown skin of an elder a Hawaiian, her hair all bundled up in a white bun with a flower. That was Hannah. She was always impeccably presented, beautifully dressed, and always genteel and shining and bright. At the Valentine's Day dance, I said, Hannah! Hello, Jeff. Long time no see. Oh, it's a great time to see you. I came and sat by her and I said, Hannah, that story is so beautiful. Yes. And true. Hannah and I knew what story I was referring to. Because 
way before that, maybe 20 years before, she and I were sitting on a bench. I was talking about storytelling and she said in her way, you know, my family comes from Kauai, from Haena. 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 Please say it. Haena. For you on the mainland and for you on Maui and Kaunoa and all you others who may not remember this story so well. Haena. The epic tale of Hi'iaka Ikapolo a Pele, the story about Pele and her sister Hi'iaka is like this. Pele falls asleep on the beach on the big island. She drifts as a dream, flies to Kauai and falls in love for three days and nights without eating with a handsome man named Lohiao. And then through time and space continuum jumps back in her body and wakes up on the beach of Oh, I had a most wonderful dream, I, and I'd like to have a little mission. Somebody do something for me. Well, Hiiaka says, yeah, I'll do what you want. And she says, go to Kauai, get that guy, and bring him back to me on the big island. Okay. And so the whole epic tale, one of the master literary works from Hawaii, is that he, as he journey, she journeys, she encounters monsters and all kinds of ogres and blah, 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 till she finally gets to Haena, where there's a cliff. She's been told that Lohiau is dead, but she knows through her clairvoyance that he still lives. She has found where he's supposed to be bodied, buried, its banana stalks. And she knows that his spirit is calling her up in the top of a cave in Hyena. And on a blistering day, she stands at the face of that cliff and through her magical powers, she starts to climb up the sheer rock face to the cave in the middle of the cliff. And up in the cave are two mo'o, two lizard ladies. And they're looking down. And they dive down. At Hi'iaka, who's climbing up the cliff. And Hi'iaka pushes them off the cliff. They dive down, they crash onto the rocks. The tide comes up to wash their body away. Hiiaka, looking down from the cliff, sees the bodies of the two Mo'o ladies who have been pounded and split on the rocks. But they don't get washed away. Their bodies re-coalesce. And the three, two Mo'o ladies start to climb up the cliff to grab at her and tear at her flesh and bite her. When she finally pushes those two Mo'o ladies off of the cliff of Hyena, conquering them, and finally gets inside the into the cave, she's like, Lohiao, where is your spirit? I know it is here. Deep in the darkness, I am here. She follows the voice into the darkness and comes unto a small calabash, a puolo, wrapped in tea leaf, a gift, basket. She knows it is the spirit of Lohiao. The spirit in Hawaiian literature is expressed as a calabash of light and over it arches a rainbow. Everyone please go. <sighs> but that's not the story I wanted to tell you. I just wanted to tell you why when she said, Haena, my family is from Haena on Kauai, I went, <sighs> I heard this story from my auntie. It happened to her. When she was 14 years old, 15, young and blooming, the whole family was picking opihi. Opihi are little mussels that attach themselves to rocks. It's a delicacy in Hawaiian cuisine. You go with a knife and try and pry them off, but they grow right on the edge of the sea on the rocks so that you have to watch out because the sea comes up 
And if you're not careful, it'll knock you. Oh, Pee Man, a mellow swell is coming your way. Bump, bump, bump. It's a popular song. Oh, Pee Man, another swell is coming your way. Bump, bump, bump. You know, watch out. Don't turn your back to the ocean. And I've watched them. They hold on to the rocks as the waves wash over them and back. They're picking Opihi, the whole family. And suddenly, where is she? She's gone. Oh, they call out, Malia, Malia, Malia. Oh, away, away. Um, she's been washed off the rock. She's not with the family. She probably hit her head. She's been taken out to sea. They spend the whole day searching for the daughter, the young one who's gone think she's dead. They go home and they mourn. But the father has the feeling that she's not gone. And he goes to see the kahuna. Now, for you who don't know what that means, kahuna are the magic men. Everything physical has a spiritual quality. And if you're going to deal with things in the physical world, you've got to deal with things in the spiritual world, too. These guys can advise you and they know the magic way. Magic. Invisible, invisible. Kahuna. Yes. She lives. And if you want her to return to you, you need to prepare a puolo, a gift package. He tells her what to put in there, him to what to put in there. And to take tea leaf. I, you heard about it when it was the spirit with the rainbow and take it down to the sea. Put it on the edge where the waves come up. The last place where you saw her, turn around, go back to your house, don't look back. Well, wouldn't you? He did exactly what he was told. He made the calabash, he wrapped the tea leaf, he went to the edge of the sea, he put it where he last saw her. He went home, didn't look back. Two days later, he was sitting in his chair when he heard the screen door open. <laughs> he turned around. There was his daughter, drenched with, with uh, sea water. <laughs> Daddy, I loved him. Why did you make me come back? And my auntie that this happened to told us the story. Yes, she was picking Opihi. Yes, the wave came up and washed her off and into the sea. Yes, she could not find the bottom. Yes, she was confused. She was very confused when she felt something come up to her and slap her on the side and hold her against itself. It went down and down. She thought it was a fish, maybe a shark. It came down and it came up. She said it was into a cave, that there was a twilight. She could see things, but she couldn't tell much. And then down again to the second time up into a second cave again the twilight this time she looked to the side it was a shark down again the third one she came up to up with and now the shark was a man who held she hit, stood up on the on a small little tunnel took her hand and led her out into the twilight world where he lived she said it was described as twilight everywhere that it had callow taro fields, but that it was twilight and he took her to a hale, a little house. He started a fire. She said that he looked like a man in his body, two arms, two legs strong, but that his face was different than men on earth. His eyes were wider. His nose was gone. He had no ears. He had only a little hair and his mouth stretched across his entire face and he had the teeth of shark. He was very kind to her. He cooked her taro, kalo, gave her fish to eat, sat at a distance. They talked for a long time into the evening and then he said, well, I think it's time for you to go to bed now. I'll see you in the morning. Just sleep right where you are. Good night. And he left. 
and she said with tears running down her face, Daddy, I didn't want him to go. The next day came again. They walked through, they went up into the mountains, there was waterfalls, there was everything on earth that she knew in a world of, in a, on Kauai, except that there were men in Kalo fields, all with the sharp teeth, features, and no women. They came down in the afternoon and then into the evening. Again, he cooked her a meal, uh, enjoyed company, talked at length. And when she went to go, she grabbed her, his leg and said, don't leave me, stay with me. But he laid on the mat next to her and did not touch her. The third day they went to the sea and enjoyed each other's company and did all the things that boys and girls would do in the surf came home, again at dinner, again the evening, I'll go, no. And this time he laid by her, but he, they did touch. And when she woke up the next morning, he was weeping out of his wide eyes and said, your father wants you back. I'm going to take you home. No, no. Yes. And he made her go to that tunnel and pushed her down into the water and dove in after her and held her by his side. One cave, two caves, third cave by then, the human form was gone. He was a shark again. He swam her into the edge of Haena, let her go in the surf. She tried to come back into the surf. He pushed her back. She tried to go deeper, pushed her back over and over again. Finally, he came so close to her, she could see his shark eye splashed with a fin, water on her face, and he was gone. That's when she came home. I loved him, Daddy. I loved him. Yes, said Hannah at the Valentine's Day dance. All true. It happened to her. She told it to me. And what Hannah Kaniakoa Basso, that gorgeous elder with her hair white pulled up and a flower, told to me, I just told to you. Hands up. Shugga, say it. Shugga. Say it again. Say it louder. Shugga. Swing. Shock. The first story you remember by the circle of love. The second story that I just told you from Hana Kane Koabaso about Haena and the cliff and that ocean and the lover that was a shark, the Hawaiian version of a selkie tail. You go like this. Let me see it. As an interlude, I would like to share with you another collage. Oh, that's not the right one. It's a woman's torso with a basket head. You know what I call it? A portrait of a woman I remember that I never met. <laughs> now I'm going to share with you my last story because our time is short between us. Thank you again for coming. Hannah's story is awesome and it brought you to Hawaii. Now I want to tell you a story about what happened when I, representing Hawaii, went to the Universal Expo in Sevilla, Spain, with the SKEP program, which is hosting this email, this uh, concert, by the way. I was one of 45 traditional and contemporary artists of Hawaii. I was definitely not traditional, so I must have been contemporary. We had uh, a stage for two weeks at the uh, 
USA Pavilion, which was voted one of the worst two in the whole exhibit. The whole world showed up. Everybody built these magnificent physical buildings, really interesting architecture, put their classic art. Uh, every night when it got dark, the bars would open up and the music would come out. I was in seventh heaven. I was in the first bus in the morning out of the military, U.S. military base, which was about an hour away. So buses ran us back and forth. I was in the first bus to go to the pavilions and I was on the last bus at the at, at midnight running wait for me wait for me I loved it there you only had to do two shows a day for me that's easy and uh, it was a <laughs> we were on a stage in this blazing sun of Sevilla Spain in the middle of July except for when we got kicked into we got kicked into that time slot because the evening show they reschedule it so that they could have the Can Can High School drill team from Kansas City doing kickups. I'm a Yankee Doodle Dandy. Well, in two weeks, in such a diverse community, I went to every pavilion every day. My favorite one was the African, like a half dome, uh, like a pyramid cut in half, like a sharp wall with big, and there were all these apartments. And all the apartments were the different nations that make up Africa selling wares, like a flea market of uh, exquisite objects and ornaments and clothing and instruments from each of the countries. My favorite place to visit was Nigeria, Nigeria. There were two ladies, I loved them. One was so beautiful, excellent. I mean, just, I was so overwhelmed with her beauty, that black ebony skin, bright gleaming eyes, teeth, bing. I, I basically didn't talk to her. She was a princess, she was the third wife of a judge who said, yes, go, have your time, have your time. The real workhorse at the Nigerian, Nigeria, that's the way she said it, Nigeria, was this massive black woman. She had no neck. It folded over whatever gorgeous, flaming, bright patterned clothing. You think Hawaii has patterns. Africa. Bish, bish. And she was huge when she laughed. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, a, like an earthquake. <laughs> and she was a blast. I loved her. We had a lot of fun. If I said a bad joke, all the prices went up. If I told a good joke or did something for her, the prices went down. Every day I looked at everything in the shop. Every day she said, oh, you should buy that. This is our last day. We leave tomorrow. Good prices. Every day was in sale. Every day I should buy everything. Now, I really like their rugs, this kind of like a Lauhala weaving, but more intricate weave. It had a black and red and green patterns in it. I thought it was really beautiful. I'd take it home. I kept going over like, ooh, I'd rub it and say, how much is this? She, oh, da, da, da. Ooh, I don't know. today's the last day. We leave tomorrow. I'll sell it to you now. Every day. Finally, it was the last day for me and I really had to buy the rug today or not at all. I went in, we talked for a while, and then I went over to the rug. Uh, how much? It is your last day. I would like this rug to go home to you for your wife. I will sell it to you for, for you, $25. But you are a storyteller. If you can tell me this, a story that makes my heart sing, I will sell it to you for $20. But if you tell me a story that makes my heart sing and my eye cry, then I will sell you the rug for $15. I said, please sit down. I said, this is my story, this is a true story, this is a love story. Believe it or not, 
Once upon a time, I was a handsome young man. And women were attracted to me like fish to bait. All around me circled schools of fish, swimming in circles, nibbling and biting. I like fish. But I said to God one day, I would like to meet a woman that I can embrace for my entire life, someone to fall in love with. I want to fall in love. I want you to send me her. At that time, I was spending a lot of time looking at tarot cards, and there was one of the empress, a blonde, furtive, fecund, uh, wheat shafts, a uh, heart of steel. Uh, she's Venus. And in the house where I was living in San Francisco at that time, I opened the door and in the doorway, there was Venus. She looked exactly like the tarot card I had been meditating, talking to God, send me the woman. We fell deeply, quickly in love. And we fell hard. And I said, you have answered my prayers. The woman has come. I am falling finally in love. This one I will keep for a long time. Ah. But as in all stories, things get complicated. And one day she walked through that door and was gone. And I said to God, why did you do it? Why did you send me a woman to love and then take her away? How did that happen? Why? Why? My heart is broken. My God said, you, you are, are too, too far away. Go, go into the mountains and, 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 and. Where, where you can hear, hear me, me better, 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 better. So I went walking in the mountains. For weeks I walked in Yosemite Valley asking to God, why is she gone? God was silent. Late one afternoon, the sun was going down. I was coming over a ridge. I was looking for a place where I might start a fire to heat some food, for my belly was growling, and I had had no food. My belly was growling. I had had no food. I was looking for a place where I might start some fire, heat up some food, and eat it, because my belly was growling. I had had eaten no food. I looked over the ridge, and there were some trees growing. I ran down the path to get to the trees. I started a little fire and uh, to heat some food, for my belly was growling. I had had no food all day. And as my belly was growling and I was starting to light the fire, the wind would come and put out the fire. And then I would start to light the fire, but the wind would come and fly away. And over and over I tried to light the fire to make some food because my belly was growling and I hadn't eaten all day. But then when the wind would go away and I would start to light the fire to have the food, the mosquitoes would come out and they would start biting me all over. And I would be trying to fight the fire while I light the fire and then the fire would lit and the mosquito and, the, and, the fire, and it went on and on and on and the sun was setting and I was getting more frustrated and finally said, forget it. Forget it. I got in my sleeping bag. I pulled the cord. There was a mummy was surrounding me fully and I pulled that string until the drawstring pulled the tarp around my face to that little <sighs> and it's then that I had the dream I dreamed that I was broken I woke up in my dream and I was uh, broken. Uh, I tried to move in my dream, but I was 
broken and I was by the side of a road and I looked at I was in mud by the side of a road I could see up at the edge and there was a road and I was broken in my dream in the side of the road and I couldn't move I tried to move and I couldn't move and there was mud and it was the side of a road and I was broken and I saw on the road beautiful people handsomely dressed talking wonderfully walking on the road and in my dream I was broken and I was trying to call to the people walking on the road but I, I had no voice and I was broke and they were walking and they walked by I could not call. But one of them turned around. And he looked and he saw me. And the beautiful one who saw me put out his hand. And out of his hand came lightning. Lightning went from his hand into my heart. And in my dream, in the mud broken, I could feel the fire burning into my heart. I twisted and gnarled in my dream and in my sleeping bag. And he withdrew the, the lightning. Over and over, Chung Jing. Finally, that tall, beautiful being went and walked on to join the others. My dream was over. I woke up in the granite passes of Yosemite in a little stand of trees. I took away the string I let the sleeping bag down, I looked up, and over my head were a billion stars, like eyes, and all the eyes were looking at me. And I began to cry, because I knew that that man with the lightning was an angel that God sent to me because he knew I was in pain and that the lightning was pulling out the pain of my broken heart and waking seeing the stars looking at me I began to cry because I knew the angel had come to heal me and I knew the meaning We do not suffer alone. The universe cares for us, responds to us, and helps us. Oh, oh it's a beautiful story. Beautiful. Oh, take the rug. Take the rug. Take the rug. Oh. I did. <laughs> I took the rug. I brought it home. I came back to Hawaii with the group. I went into my house in Wailua on the North Shore. I rolled out the rug. My wife said, what's this? I said, yeah, I know. let me tell you the story. I told her the whole story. And she said, huh, you're such a romantic. <laughs> oh, I forgot one part. This African lady said, wait, one more question, one more question. I said, what? She said, that woman, you know, the one that went through the door and left you. What about her? I said, so far, she and I, so far we have two children, two daughters. Ah, take the run. Well, 
she's now my ex-deceased wife. Not all stories end where they should. <laughs> but it's such a beautiful story. We do not suffer alone. And that's the end of my session uh, for Skep. I just want to do one thing. Move, my love. Where my wife just ran by. You see that rug? I brought it out of my studio to show you. That's the rug that I brought back from Nigeria. And with that, I'll say hands up, shuck, reach out, sink, pull back, boom. Put that story in your pocket. First story, circle of love. Second story, the lit cliff of Haena and the third story, of course, the do it, the let me see you do it, dream. You're not alone. Thank you for your attention. I think we're going to do some questions and answers, and I think you guys did great. Let's give Mr. Jeff a virtual Zoom hand. Go like this, and now move your hands closer. Tim, Thank you there? Man. I'm here. Thank you. That was amazing. You're wonderful as ever. Uh, we, do, <laughs> hey. we do have um, a few questions uh, for you if you have a few moments. I uh, love As a storyteller, asked one person, what do you hope the audience takes with them from your performance? <laughs> I hope they have fun. <laughs> I hope they're not bored. I hope something happened in their heart. I hope that that made uh, the gift of their attention worth giving. Okay. I hope I didn't make anybody mad. Oh, I, I don't think so. Um, do you have any advice for a fourth grader who's terrified of talking in front of people? Well, I would say to that fourth grader that he should remember that he talks to people all the time and the well telling a story is just part of that uh, skill called I can talk to people and communicate my ideas and that's what's most important not that you become a performer fourth grade friend but that you work on the ability to speak to people and take the picture in your brain move it through words into the brains of others so they see what you're thinking and what you're trying to say and your point of view. You're only in fourth grade. Get uncomfortable and work on it. All right. Um, are there any storytellers who have influenced you? <laughs> Every storyteller influences me, for better or for worse. Many of them are in this, uh, this Zoom chat. I like Neil DeBurka, who's from Ireland. Kathy Collins on Maui is one of my friends and heroes, or heroettes. Uh, there are many. Uh, I would have to include in that Jimi Hendrix. I would have to include in that uh, uh, Pete Seeger. Uh, right off the top of my head, that's among my heroes. Okay. Wonderful group of heroes. Yeah. Um, another question. Uh, this is sort of more contemporary here. Are you doing more virtual shows? Are you doing more <laughs> virtual shows this summer? That's a question for Tim Slaughter. Okay. <laughs> we'll work on that. I'll be, we'll ha I'll that. be happy to do it. I actually have rescheduled a, a, a ton of. I do the summer fun. I've done it for 30 years. Uh, parks and Rec, they don't have any money. I just love the kids. I love performing for kids. I love performing. And June was canceled, so I rescheduled, I think it's at this point, 35 shows in July because I'm not going to India and I'm not going to Java in October. Uh, now, for the fourth grader who wants to stretch his chops and for all of you, one more little image. You see the little head at the bottom and the spiral of the, the flower, and you see hanging up in the tree all those shirts and clothing. I just shared some of those memory shirts with you in this session. This is called The Laundry of Memory.
All right. That's wonderful. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for being part of the... Oh, oh we're done? Well, I have to finish with this image. Oh, that's right. You do have your other image. May the stories bloom in your mind like this image in your eye. Mahalo for coming. Thank you, Tim, for having me, and thank you all for attending. I love it. I love it. I love it. I want to say um, thank you once again to our sponsors of SCEP Live Online, the Hawaii State Foundation on Culture and the Arts, the National Endowment for the Arts, the University of Hawaii, and in this case, Kaunoa and the Kaunoa Senior Services. And um, I do want to remind everybody, too, that we start again next week, Monday, at 1030 with um, Dan Seke reading ghost stories from Japan. <laughs> and then on Thursday at 630, we have Jeff Peterson. And Friday at 1030, we have stories with Dave Del Rocco. So thank you, everyone. And we look forward to seeing you again. And uh, thank you, Jeff. And everyone, take care and stay safe. Mahalo.